Peace and Black Power. Hotep, shalom to you, brother. What's going on? Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, shalom. Peace, peace. Um, what you been up to, man? I know you got a lot of stuff going on, like you always do. Uh, same old, same old, man. Teaching behind the scenes, shaking, making moves. Yes. Family yes. man, moves. touring. Mm -hmm. Trying to plan some trips. Supposed to be heading to uh, West Africa, Ghana, to be exact. Wow. Wow. Yeah, doing a lot of work to make that happen. I'm actually trying to bring a, um, a whole group of people with me, so doing a lot of work behind the scenes, man. Yeah, that's what it is, man. You always been working, so I mean, this ain't nothing new. I'm not surprised. But anyway, um, you and Divine Prospect, y'all got something coming up, which is a great thing. It's going to be in Midtown Manhattan downtown, and that's yep. why we're waiting on Divine to come on in. But yo, um, I, while we waiting on him, I want to know about your growth and development because you shock the Hebrew world, brother. When you took on the case of the the New Testament, I'm gonna harken back on that. You shocked the world when you began to believe in Jesus Christ. I ain't gonna lie, you damn sure shocked me. You shocked <laughs> me on that one, man. <laughs> when you started saying, you know, you you believe in the Messiah of the Christ. Talk to us about that. What made you change your mind about Jesus Christ? Well, I already knew that he was a historical person and just analyzing the content of what the Bible has to say about the promised Messiah, uh, I realized at least almost seven years now that um, he definitely fits the bill. So that that's where I stand. Okay. But now, Zion, you know what? I am still not, because I know who you are. I know what you are, brother. I'm still not a believer in that, man. That's fine. The reason I'm saying that is because I know you are a brother that just likes to bridge the gap to bring unity amongst the Israelites, whether I whether I believe in you or not. And so you would you would go that far to say, you know what, I I, I believe this because your your job is to bridge the gap and to bring Israelites together. So I'm not mad at you for that. But I'm I'm not believing, <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> you are <laughs> Testament Israelite, but I'm not buying it, man. I'm not going. Jesus, with it. Jesus was an Old Testament Israelite. Hmm? Let's not forget that there wasn't no New Testament in his era. He was an Old Testament Israelite too. Now you know there's Israelites that say you can't find Jesus in the Old Testament, only in the Absolutely. New Testament. Absolutely, I'm aware of that. Yep. All right, we got Armin Ra in the building. Shout out to my man Armin Ra McCarthy. He said Christ will not be denied. Okay. There you go, brother. There you go. That's what's up. That's there you go. Up. So funny as F. <laughs> Why you say so funny as F, man? I'm not cursing no more. See, y'all trying to make me curse. I'm trying not to use profanity. I got to be a little better, you know? I'm not trying to use no profanity. No profanity at all. I'm trying to turn the platform around. So anyway, talk to us about, um, you know, what you got coming up, Zion. All right. So I'm planning uh, two trips. I got a trip that I'm planning first to Israel, where I would like to take a whole group of people there. Also have a trip upcoming where we're going to Ghana. Um, the most recent thing that I have going is a museum tour. You know, around this time every year, so I got a bunch of museum tours happening. So I got two museum tours back to back. The first one is, of course, the Met Museum. The next one is Brooklyn Museum. And then from there, we'll actually be going to the Slave Museum in D.C. Bro, you got to give me a call to roll with you, man. I would love to go with you, brother. No doubt, man. No doubt. No like doubt. Doing you like I do the, um, Jabari and them, and let's go through it. Let's do it, man. No doubt, man. No doubt. Yeah, I think. Since I got into going to the museums, man, it's, it's addictive. Yeah. It's absolutely addictive. Yeah. Where are you at, man, in your um field of research when it comes to the metal nature? Oh, you, my you God. Up a little <laughs> higher? Are I you would definitely say people who say they know it, they better make sure they know it. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I'm going to say, because one thing about me... I don't stop studying anything, man. My studies always advance. I have a track history. 
of advancing in study. So to answer your question, the best way I'd answer it is by saying, whoever say they know it, they just better make sure they know it. All right. We was waiting on the man to come in to talk about the event that's coming up. And of course, we got him in the building. Divine, Divine Prospect. Prospect. Shout out to you, brother. You have always, Devon, been working. Boots on the ground. Always, since I've known you, you've <laughs> always been, you and Zion, matter of fact. Y'all have always been taking care of business. It's not always on YouTube. When people don't see you, you best believe you are out there in the field. Boots on the ground. What's up, my brother? How you been? And hey, what's going on, Sa? Peace and shalom. Uh, shalom to my brother, uh, Omore, Zion Lex in the building. Shalom, shalom, Devon. Yep. Um, yeah. We had a mutual associate who's part of my organization, had reached out to Zion so he could be a guest of honor to speak at uh, this event that I put together. Um, and because it's very significant, right? Um, and I think a lot of people are not aware of it. Actually, so the only person I know from your side that I really communicate with about this in the past was Brother Reggie. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Brother Reggie was boots on the ground with me as well, right? I got right. a video and everything to show with me and Brother Reggie going to the UN, you know what I'm saying? Asking questions, inquiring, doing interviews and all of that. You know what I'm saying? This was back in 2018. You know what I'm saying? That Reggie was there with me. And then I went two other times, uh, one time by myself, the first time I went, which was in 2016. And then the last time I went, which is in 2019, I went with a small group, you know what I'm saying? And when COVID hit, then you couldn't go to the UN anymore. You know what I'm saying? Um, but thank you for um, you know this opportunity to actually speak about this event that is going down this Sunday, March 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at the Balance Arts Center. You know what that's at, Sal? Um, 30th Street, 151 yep. West. I wish you would have came on earlier to talk about this, brother. Why you say that? Because that way we could have promoted it a lot better. You know, it's coming up this Sunday, but people are just getting to know, you know. But that's that fine. Point, Listen, that's and if you if you for black liberation, does it matter what time of day it is? No. I got responsibilities. You told me last minute, 7 p.m. Guess what? I'm right here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You come on, um, last minute. And you here, brother. Yeah. So can you move that flyer? Uh, away I want you to talk about the flyer real quick oh. and then I'm moving. Well, I am. Okay. Okay. So I just talked about it, right? The name of the event is called Descent for Greatness. It's our March on the UN. So pretty much what this event is about is that there's a program called the International Decade for People of African Descent that is being hosted and promoted by the United Nations and the international communities who actually signed the Durban Resolution. Durban is a city in um, South Africa, if you're unaware of. Um, and the purpose of it was to examine all of the peoples who were displaced by way of the transatlantic slave trade and the Ma'afa who have been displaced from the continent of Africa. And now they're behind enemy lines and facing adverse conditions, stereotyping, racism, xenophobia, racial intolerance, et cetera. And this is putting them at a disadvantage for them getting anywhere in regards to that society, whether it has to do with things regarding to recognition, them identifying as a people, their contributions to society, um, or whether it's justice, like we see here in the United States, where we are subject to tons of police brutality or red taping away and keeping us from prime real estate in cities and in towns that we can possibly move to, um, lack of access to greater education or higher education that a lot of us cannot afford, right? Or whether it's health access to good health care, a lot of us can't afford that. So the purpose of this community is to allow the international community to get involved in the actual plight of our people. Now, I didn't get a chance to put a PowerPoint together for you because this is very, very, I guess, early to even do something like that. But I do have a PDF where I do have some notes on it that I would like to read from, if that's OK with you, sir. Yes, of course. Can I share my screen? Of course, brother. Let's get right, to now, now before now, before I start, I want to show you a picture. I actually put it at the end of of this uh, PDF, but I want to show you a picture and I want to ask you who it is, because this is another friend of mine who actually is boots on the ground working with this program that you know personally. Matter of fact, this is one of your elders, sir. You ready? Why are you smiling like that? All right, let me put it up. Hold on real quick. Let me see. Uh, let me see. If I, let me put it I better know who it is, man. <laughs> of course you know who it is. Watch. You're going to be like, oh, that's... I want to I want to see if you know exactly who this is. I know you know who this is, sir. All right, let me see. Hold on. Let me see. Can I present? Can I present? What's going on? What's going on? All right, here it is. All right, so I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to take you to the last screen. Who's that, sir? 
Oh, I don't know who that is. What? Zion, no. you know who that is, Zion? No. Of course, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Thank you. Hassan don't know his eldest. Man, that's crazy, son. I don't, I don't know who that is, man. You don't know who Dr. Leonard Jeffries is? Nah, where, where he from? What? Yo, ask your chat. <laughs> yo, yo, where bring Brother from? Reggie on. Yo, I just told you, son. Wow. You don't know who Dr. Leonard Jeffries is? Is he from Africa, right? What? He know who he, he know who he is, Divine. He you know he don't have him on the platform. He playing with you. <laughs> Come on, Divine. Of course, who don't know Dr. Come on, I don't know what to say. Come so, on, man. This is a good elder vine who has been uh, yes. working with the program since its inception, and I've seen him on each visit, and I had stayed in communication with him because his organization is actually doing something about it. He actually spoke publicly on this several times as well. And um, I told him what the work was that I was doing. And he always encourages me, gives me advice. If I need anything, let him know. Very, very good, humble elder who's actually about the liberation of our people and been doing it for years, as you know, sir. You know what I'm saying? I wish he was available, but, you know, he's kind of elderly now. You know, so. All you got to do with him, Devon, is set a camera in front of him, ask him one question, and just move out the way. Go to Brooklyn, <laughs> and he going to just go off. You know? Trust me. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, so I just wanted to show that real quick, Sai, so you know who this is. Now I'm gonna um I'm gonna go all the way to the top and I'm just gonna point a couple of things out if you're okay with that, right? Now, Sai, yeah. I created a um a promo video that I sent for you. Can you play that video real quick? It's only four minutes. It's pretty much gonna summarize everything, and I'm just gonna go through a few major points. Can't hear you muted, Sai. The African-American community. Their existence in America is the result of the transatlantic slave trade, a horrific and tragic event which dispersed millions into a shameful diaspora. Their ancestors were used as chattel slaves to build one of the greatest nations on earth, the United States of America. Yet they nor their descendants received any monetary reparations for their labors. Even with efforts during Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Movement, any request for substantial change to their subpar living conditions has been largely ignored. As a result, the community was treated like a cancer to society, with problems ranging from poverty, high crime rate, police brutality, housing disparities, meager education opportunities, increased health concerns, and little to no recognition for their grand contributions towards societal developments, their pleas fell on deaf ears at the state and federal levels. It seems all hope for aid is bleak. Various leaders in the past, such as Malcolm X, have made attempts to bring these issues to the international community to hold America accountable for its human rights violations against them. Yet, despite the odds, black people have managed to prosper just enough to influence the world with their struggles, success stories, talents, skills, foods, and soul. This has intrigued the international community to look deeper into their plight. As a result, in 2001, the United Nations Durban Declaration and Plan of Action was proposed out of deep sympathy for those forcibly dispersed into the African diaspora. Over the course of 12 years of continuous conferences and debates, the UN General Assembly, by its Resolution 68-237 of December 23, 2013, proclaimed the International Decade for People of African Descent commencing on January 1st, 2015 and ending on December 31st, 2024, with the theme being People of African Descent, Recognition, Justice, and Development. The main objective of the International Decade is to promote respect, protection, and fulfillment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms for people of African descent, as recognized in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The decade will provide an opportunity to recognize the significant contribution made by people of African descent to our societies and to propose concrete measures to promote their full inclusion and to combat all forms of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance. It will enable United Nations, member states, civil society, and all other relevant actors to join with people of African descent and take effective measures for the implementation of the program of activities in the spirit of recognition, justice, and development. Finally, a plausible solution to the plight and societal ills of African Americans is now attainable. However, very few are aware of this program and even fewer participate. 
the United States has not made much effort to advertise, promote, or implement the objectives of this program, thereby leaving no room for demand from black people. With no outcry for application, the powers that be are hoping that this opportunity passes the second class citizens by with no resistance. Thankfully, today, organizations such as Kingdom Harbinger Ministries have become aware of this grave situation and is standing on the mountaintops and lifting up a war cry for all those in the diaspora to get involved in its plan of action. But they need your help. This is your chance to learn more and do more by holding this nation accountable and raising awareness of these objectives. Sunday, March 24th, 2024 marks a pivotal moment in history where you can actually get involved and make a difference. See what Kingdom Harbinger Ministries is doing with this program to mitigate the adverse conditions of the black community. Join us at our event called Descend for Greatness, March of the United Nations. Get your tickets on Eventbrite by clicking the link below. The clock is ticking and December 31st, 2024 is the last window of opportunity to integrate this solution. Are you ready for a functional revolution? If so, we'll see you there. All right, and I need okay. everybody to know, everybody need to know, if you haven't gotten your ticket, you can look right there in the description. It's right there. The link is right there. You see where it says Eventbrite. Get your ticket right there. Click that link, and it takes you right to the Eventbrite. All right? Go ahead, brother. Devon. All right. Appreciate that, sir. All right. So um, as y'all can see, y'all can go back and check out this video as well. It's on my YouTube channel called Kingdom Harbinger Ministries, H A. H-A-R-B-I-N-G-E-R, -E Kingdom Harge Ministries. You'll see that video. And also, so if you don't mind, if you could put that uh, in the description afterwards, you can drop that link there as well so people can yes. go back and watch the video. The video is four minutes and 30 seconds, and it summarizes everything, right? The plight of our people in the country, attempts by certain, world, uh, certain uh, leaders within our community who have attempted to do what I'm about to talk about, then us persevering and through our success and being able to survive all the adverse conditions and effects and stuff that we've been through uh, made a noise enough in all the world, the global community. A lot of us keep thinking about just local community, the global community, and put pressure on those political leaders who are diplomats at the UN for them in South Africa to come about and say, hey, look, we have to do something about the people in the, in the diaspora, right? Especially all the nations involved who put us and displaced us there against our will. Right. So they decided in 2001 during this Durban conference that, you know, the U.N., they meet in Geneva, the, the U.S. and where you at in New York, side, in South Africa, et cetera, to put forth this resolution on ways how they can remove all of the things that are holding us back from getting up here, providing us with the equity. So not only can we compete at a, at a level that's right here, but also exceed it. The problem with black people is we always talk about black power and all this other stuff, but but y'all not exerting any power. There's, there's, you're not changing anything the way it needs to be changed. In 2017, I did a lecture called Globalizing Black Power. Now, Sa, which I don't know if you was there for that. That event, actually, you was there, Sa. It, you, it was you, Ankh. Uh, who else was there um, at the event back in 2017? And I told Ankh that I was going to do a better presentation than him. Remember that, Sa? Yeah. So y'all go back and watch that video because what I'm doing is I'm showing you how to actualize that program right now, today, right? You can actually do it. But at this event, we're going to go in more detail on the things that you can do. So let me go ahead and show this. So you can share my screen now, sir, if you don't mind. I can't hear you. We can't hear you, sir. Yeah, this is what makes you brothers elite over the other Israelites. I know y'all don't like separating yourself. That's why I'm doing it. You know what I'm saying? This is what make you brothers more advanced than the others because you're willing to fight for Africa. You are not out there saying the crazy things that other Israelites will say. And so this is what makes you brothers um, stand out way more so. All right, so here's your presentation right here you got. Go yeah, sorry. so the first thing I'm going to go through now, Asa, um, you are, you're my elder, right? So you're you're older than me, right? Do you remember this right here in 1964? Yes. I don't want to shout your age out. I don't know, you know how old you are. But do you remember this in 1964 with our yeah. brother Malcolm X, what he did? Yes. Okay. So it says here, Malcolm X seeks UN Negro debate. He asks African states to cite U.S. 
over rights violations. The State Department and the Justice Department have begun to take an interest in Malcolm X's campaign to convince African states to raise the question of persecution of American Negroes in the United States. The Black Nationalist leader started his campaign on July 17th in Cairo, where the 33 heads of independent African states held their second meeting since the Organization of African Unity was founded in Addis Ababa 14 months ago. Before leaving for Cairo, Malcolm told friends in New York that it was his intention to add a new dimension to the civil rights struggle in the United States. This, he said, could be achieved by internationalizing the Negro question at the United Nations in the manner that South African apartheid was transferred into a international problem. Malcolm's eight-page memorandum in the hands in the, uh, to the heads of state at the Cairo conference requesting their support became available here only recently. After studying it, officials said that if Malcolm succeeded in convincing just one African government to bring up the charge at the United Nations, the United States government would face a touchy problem. United States officials here believe would find itself in the same category as South Africa, Hungary, and other nations whose domestic politics have become debating issues at the United Nations. The issue, officials say, would be of the service to critics of the United States, communists and non-communists, and contribute to the undermining of the position the United States has asserted for itself as the leader of the West in the advocacy of human rights. Yo, this is the issue. They're, they were so afraid of this that the UN actually wrote a report in 2016 acknowledging that one of the reasons why Malcolm is no longer here is because of this. See, this is not a light fight. Y'all thinking that Malcolm decided I'm going to become Orthodox Islam and come back and start an African organization for our people in America. No, 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 no. The government don't care about that. When you do something like this, now it's like, okay, time to assassinate this man. He can't, he, he cannot do this because guess what? All those reparations, the basis of that you're arguing about, we would have had it. All the charges, criminal charges for violation against human rights, we would have had that. We would have had so much that we could have despoiled the United States for all of the grievous crimes they've done against us if we get it to the international community. Not appealing it at the state level, not appealing it at the federal level. Why would you appeal to your enemy to hear your emotional outcry to the damage they've done to you and then expect them to provide you with all the tools necessary to liberate yourself and topple them in the sense where now charges can be derived against them. You can get your reparations and we can build our own communities. This is what they was afraid of. And if I had time, I would go over and read that report to you from the United Nations about what Malcolm attempted to do, which is one of the reasons why this program exists today. We stand on our ancestors' shoulders to get this done. We're not doing this out of the blue or didn't come from, from somewhere out of heaven. No, this is our ancestors who lived, breathed, and bled and died so we can get to this point today. So out of respect for Malcolm, this is why it's my obligation to bring what is being done, something that he started that now is actualized in 2024 that we can actually utilize. And the only way it can happen is if black folk know about it and if we execute it. But guess what? When I go through this, most of y'all never even heard that this even existed. This is not on the radio. It's not on social media. It's not on the media because the people that control all of that they don't want you to know about this. So let's keep going. I'm going to read this rest of part with the letter and I'm going to jump down. And a letter from Cairo to a friend Malcolm wrote, I have gotten several promises of support in bringing our plight before the UN this year. According to one diplomatic report, Malcolm had not met with success, but the report was not documented and officials here today conceded the possibility that Malcolm might have succeeded. Passages in Malcolm's memorandum indicated that he had encountered resistance to his idea. When you talk about black power, this is how you do it. You must globalize it. This is what Malcolm said. He understood this. You can't do it domestically because you're behind enemy lines. You got to send a kite out to somebody that's just as big and just as bad as the enemy that's oppressing you. It says some African leaders at the conference, he said his member of them, have implied that they have enough problems here on the mother continent without adding what? The Afro-American problem. Now, Sa, how does that make you feel? This is back in 64, Sa. How, did, how does that make you feel? 
This is what Malcolm said. This right here, it makes me feel good to see a young brother now is picking up the torch and keeping the words of Malcolm alive and not only just talking about it, but trying to add on to it now and do something about it. So that's great to see you, my brother Zion, and y'all carrying out this mission. That's great, brother. That's great. Now watch this. So at the time, Malcolm said that these, these 33 heads that represent African nations, they did not want to bring on the African-American problem. Well, what wound up being discovered after the fact is not because these African heads of state did not want to support us in our plight. It's because the Western powers came to them and said, hey, you about to help Malcolm? Yeah, you know that billion dollar debt you owed us? Yeah, we about to uh, default it if you get involved in this. They kept those African nations away from us. This is what they do, divide and conquer. They keep us apart because when we're separated, we have no power. When we That's disorganize, right. we have no power, That's right? right. So this is the problem that Malcolm faced. Now, we're going to fix that in 2024. We're not going to let him die in vain, right? It says this, with all due respect to your esteemed positions, I must remind all of you that the good shepherd will leave 99 sheep at home to go to the aid of the one who was lost and who has fallen into the hands of the imperialist wolf. We in America are your long lost brothers and sisters. And I'm here to remind you that our problems are your problems. You mm. see this? Now, I'm going I'm to I'm fast forward. He says, Malcolm also warned the heads of African states that their countries will have no future. Listen to this, sir. Unless the American Negro problem was solved. Why do you think a six, uh, uh, six state of the African Union was created for the African diaspora? They know with our help, we can get rid of any kind of Western involvement in our affairs. And we can be autonomous and sovereign and solve our own problems and liberate ourselves. We shouldn't be looking for handouts. We just need to be united. Your problems will never be fully solved until and unless ours are solved. You will never be fully respected until and unless we are also respected. You will never be recognized as free human beings until and unless we are also recognized and treated as human beings. This is Malcolm X. A lot of people don't know about this history, sir. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to read this last part right here. It says, if United States Supreme Court Justice Arthur Goldberg, Goldberg, yeah, um, a few weeks ago, could find legal grounds to threaten to bring Russia before the United Nations and charge her with violating the human rights of less than 3 million Russian Jews. What makes our African brothers hesitate to bring the United States government before the United Nations and charge her with violating the human rights of 22 million African Americans? Go ahead, Malcolm. We pray that our African brothers have not freed themselves of European, excuse me, we pray that our African brothers have not freed themselves of European colonialism only to be overcome and held in check by American dollarism. Don't let American racism be legalized by American dollarism. This is why I said, they said, yo, we're going to default all you African heads of state. We're going to default what y'all owe. Yeah, we're going to default that if you help these African Americans in the diaspora. But guess what? If y'all tried your TVs turn off for the past year, you know there's a revolution going on in Africa and they're kicking the West out. This is the best time for us to get involved here and work with our brothers and sisters across the pond to get this work done. See, y'all gotta, when you people talk about prophecy, pro, no, 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 prophecy is the current events and looking for the opportunity so we can put in work and we can liberate ourselves. We can't wait for no government to liberate us. We're not waiting for the sky to crack for somebody to liberate us now. We can't wait for none of that. We have the tools to get it done right now. Lastly, the black nationalists who quit the Chicago-based Black Muslim movement led by Elijah Muhammad to form his non-sectarian organization of Afri-American unity said it was the intention of his group in coalition with other Negro groups to elevate our freedom struggle, what? Above the domestic level of civil rights. This is where the buck stops because you cannot, again, cannot Keep going to the state and federal government and say, please help us. Please liberate us. Please fix our communities. Please fix our schools. Please give us more money. This is what we're doing. And the ones who have power, who have wealth and affluence, they're turning a blind eye to this. You know why? Because they got white dollars in their black pockets. When you got a hand all down your pocket, where can you go? They give them a long leash. That's why they do everything but what's necessary to liberate black people. So the program of activities for the implementation of the International Decade for People of African Descent. 
The UN General Assembly proclaimed, now mind you, it was African nations who put pressure on the UN to do this. So when people say, oh, the United Nations is a bunch of white people. No, no, it was African nations who look back retrospectively and all their history where certain big nations brought before the UN and given sanctions and, and excluded and so forth and say, hey, what about America? Hey, what about these other nations like uh, the United Kingdom and France and Spain and Portugal? They haven't been affected by this yet. So let's do something about it. So before you harp and say it was the white man who did this, they put pressure on the white man to do this because they said that this is a necessary problem that needs to be resolved now. The UN General Assembly proclaimed 2015 to 2024. I've been doing this since 2015. I've been doing this almost 10 years to bring awareness to this program, and it's all over YouTube. As the International Decade for the People of African Descent, Revolution 68, backslash 237, citing the need to strengthen national, regional, and international cooperation, international cooperation in relation to the full enjoyment of economic, social, cultural, civil, and political rights by people of African descent and their full and equal participation in all aspects of society. As proclaimed by the General Assembly, the theme for the international decade is people of African descent, recognition, justice, and development. What is the objective? It's three points. The main objectives of the international decade are as follows. Promote respect, protection, and fulfillment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by people of African descent as recognized in a universal declaration of human rights. Promote a greater knowledge of and respect for the diverse heritage, culture, and contributions of people of African descent to the development of societies and adopt and strengthen national, regional, and international legal frameworks according to the Durban Declaration and Program of Action and the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discriminations and to ensure their full and effective implementation. This has never been done before. This is a vision that Malcolm had. Malcolm, when he went overseas, some of y'all just think he went to Mecca. And he did his thing. as it? No, no. He said, whoa, I got to go to Cairo. <laughs> I know they're about to have a conference there with 33 heads of state from African nations. I need to talk to them. And what I read to you above is some of the things that he said in correspondence with them. This was his vision. This is his vision to liberate our people. Why nobody picking up the torch? You know why? Because y'all don't know about it. I found out about this by accident. Watch this. I'm going to say this real quick before I proceed. How I found out about this in 2015, Dr. Yosef Ben Yachanan had passed away, right? He had a wake. I went to his wake. He had a funeral. I went to his funeral, right? I paid my respects, right? Met the man one time in my life. I paid my respects. But at the wake, me and a group of others were leaving from the wake. We was on the subway and there were two elderly ladies that was on the subway. So, you know, we're talking and stuff like that about conscious stuff and all of that. Right. And then one of the ladies, she heard it. She said, hey, let me speak to you real quick, young man. So she called me over to her and she has some pamphlets in her hand. And she said, hey, did you hear about the International Decade for People of African Descent? I'm like, what what the hell is that? I don't know what that is. She said, yeah, um, I just want to let you know that this is a program that will actually help us to get the liberation that we, mind you, these women are in the late 70s, 80s, that we've been fighting for since the civil rights era. I'm like, how is that possible? There's no way that we can do more than what y'all did during the civil rights. She said, no, let me explain this to you, because the more of us that know about this, the more we could do. So she gave me some of the pamphlets and she shared with me. And I asked her, what organization are you a part of? She said the Rainbow Coalition, you know, Jesse Jackson's organization. And she said Jesse Jackson was was involved in this. So I was skeptical at first. You already know. I'm like, what? The Rainbow Coalition, Jesse Jackson. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I don't know about this. You know what I'm saying? I was highly skeptical about it. But then after I took her information, I said, you know what? Let me go back and research this, because if I dismiss it out of ignorance, then I'm no better than anybody else who's promoting white supremacy, right? If this is a tool that we can use for our liberation, then I need to get on top of it. So I went ahead and I researched it. I went to the UN, I made some phone calls and I saw that this program was legit. However, it was being held back. The advertising promotion was not going to everybody else. See, people like Jesse Jackson, he's involved or he's a party to this program to benefit his organization. He's not out here telling everybody about this. And most of the quote unquote black leaders that know about this and that's aware of it, with the exception of our beloved uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, right? And a few others, they're keeping it to themselves. They're not proclaiming it on the mountaintops. 
So when I found out about it, I said, look, I ain't got those political ties. I ain't got to be politically correct. I'm going to speak about it. I'm going to yell about it. And I'm going to tell everybody and their mama about it. So that's how I found out about it by accident. And I, I would say, bless the soul of Dr. Uh, Joseph Ben Yakinan, because if he did not pass, wow, this is deep. If he didn't pass, I would not have been on the train at that time to learn about this. Now, you want to talk about the most high, the creator, all of this stuff works in mysterious ways. I don't know about all of that, but I know that I was meant to be on a train on that day to find out about this, to tell this to y'all so we can do something about this. All right, let's keep going. And I think that's the Dr. Ben, his spirit, the ancestors saying, yo, you got to do something, right? I'm going to allow us an opportunity for more work to get put in. All right. So I'm going to scroll. I'm scroll down. Before you go on, can I ask? Oh, yes. I want to yeah. ask you a serious question and uh, maybe maybe um, Zion, let's get, get in on this. Okay. Because I want you to see this comment because you're going to be faced with this from a few people. What do you say to brothers and sisters that may respond like this? <laughs> uh, you want to go first, Zion? Why not? I, I gotta go. I gotta go as well. I got a class at eight, so why not? Um, and thank you, uh, Divine, first and foremost, for you know the invite and allowing me to share that space, man. What I definitely want to say in promotion of the event is, people, make sure you get there. If there's one thing about myself, Divine, and I'm sure the other speakers, we're gonna be bringing fire in that room and in that environment mm -hmm. and at the UN. We're not coming there to tiptoe through the tulips. I think you guys know how we both talk. We give it up. It's going to be a powerful event. Now, um, the, the, the statement, Africans is African. We American. They tell us that's not our their brothers. W with all due respect, it's a silly statement. Right. right. Because the, the statement tells me that due to someone's ignorance, I should not want to work with an entire group of people. So, yeah, there are uh, Africans on the continent that separate and divide themselves from us. But there's also African-Americans here that separate and divide themselves from Africans over there. Yeah, so, I mean, the logic just don't make sense. Right. So, so what I will say again is thank you, Sonetta, for the platform. I don't think I need to say anything else about it. Thank you for the platform. Devon is going to do an amazing job continuing. Devon, I'll see you Sunday. And to the community, this is going to be one powerful event. And I want to say something. I had no idea of what was going on. And this speaks to the tremendous work of Brother Divine Prospect because had he not brought this to my attention, I would not have even been made aware of right. what's going on. So now shout out to the good Brother Divine. Now you know how to prepare, Zion. I know you're going to bring that smoke now. Well, you know, that's one thing we always do. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why Divine found it, you know, very much okay to have me on the event. We're going to come prepared and we're going to come ready to give this work. Yes. <laughs> All right. So salute. Salute. I'm coming in a fireman outfit, Divine. Appreciate <laughs> it. All right. Peace. More fire. <laughs> All right. Appreciate All right. you, Zion. Yes. Go All ahead. Right. So yeah, so I'll speak on that. So so did you see what Malcolm said? People who make statements like that, sir, have not traveled to Africa. Mm, they have not right. read any of the works, autobiography, or listened to the speeches of our leaders here in America. They don't know anything about divide and conquer. They don't know any of these things that the white supremacy infrastructure is doing to keep us apart. Mm. I'm going to say this. So when I went to the UN, and this video is on, it's on YouTube. When I went to the UN, I sat down and listened to all the member states that had something to say about this program. You know, what, was the, what do you think? Who do you think is the number one country that is promoting this event? It's in Africa. Who would you say it is, sir? Ghana. Yes. How you know, sir? How you know? <laughs> I, I mean, take a lucky guess, bro. <laughs> wow, that's what's up, man. I just that's took true. a lucky guess. So I have, I have footage. Yeah, I have footage of me sitting in, listening to them convene. And every time Ghana, to the three times I've been, every time Ghana gets up to speak, the first thing they do is apologize to us, sir. Then they say... We See apologize that? for what our ancestors did to our ancestors, which is you guys, right? Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two, they said, look, we have made changes to our legal framework so that you can come here and prosper. 
You don't have to ask America for reparations no more. We have land, we have labor, and we have the tools so you can build here. Number three, they have a program called Panifest that they have biannually. Have you ever heard of Panifest before, Sa? No. Panifest is designed to welcome those in the diaspora in hopes that they repatriate. They you chopping up, you chopping up, brother. You chopping up, you chopping up right no no you chopping up you, you breaking up and then they say divine divine you're breaking up brother you're breaking up all right let me kick him out so he know see when you kick him out he know he'll come right back in yeah, brother, um, you're wrong for saying that statement. I agree 100% with Zion Lex. Meanwhile, oh, he's back. He's divine is back. Yeah, right, he was back. No, yeah, you back. Um, so, so Panifest is the program that they have every, I would say, biannually. I've been to one of them where they welcome us home, right? They apologize for what they did to us, and then they say, You don't have to ask for reparations. We have land, labor, and tools so you can build here, so we can work together. We want your IP, your intellectual property, and everything that you've experienced and learned along the way, bring it here. So they have programs. They have the land. They have resources. They have everything available for Africans and the diaspora, more particularly those of us here. Now, guess what? If somebody is not keeping up with what that nation is doing in Africa for us, of course, they're going to say stuff like that, Sa. I don't get mad when I see comments like that. It's just ignorance. Our people don't know any better. So I pity them. I don't really get upset over that, right? And guess what? Here's an opportunity to invite them to investigate it further if they still hold that point of view. And I guarantee if they come to the event, we're going to prove that wrong. We're going to give you all the proofs of what they're doing over there for us. But most people haven't traveled over there or don't know anybody doing the work over there. So guess what? Your experience is limited to here in America. How can you look at a few Africans that come from Western Central Africa over here to America and think that they represent everything that's over there? That's not true. That's like passport brothers. You know passport brother. You heard that phrase before, right, Sai? Yeah. You know, African-American black dudes going overseas looking for a wife and all this other stuff. Do they represent you, Sai? Who? The passport brothers. No. The passport brothers is a group of black men that travel uh -huh. overseas because they don't want black women in America that look for foreign women overseas to mess with, maybe get as a wife or whatever the case may be. I said, does that represent you? Are you no. going to go to France and get a white woman to marry, sir? Hell no. That's not that <laughs> so, <no. laughs> That's not so somebody see a, if, look, listen, if those white women see a black man over there who loves them and wants to be with them and all of that, that does not represent you. No. And that's the, that's the limited experience and the scope of experience that black men have in here in America about Africans that come over here. They come over here with a purpose. Their purpose is not about liberation. But right. the ones over there, they can't get over here because they want revelation. They want revelation. They want revolution. And they want retribution. Right? In a legal format that can bring justice to black people. That's why they don't let those over here over here. You got to go over there to see the revolutionaries over there. They're not over here. So do not limit your scope of understanding what our sympathizing brothers and sisters over there on the continent are, where they are, where they're at, how they feel, based on the limited scope of experience that you have with a few bad run-ins here in America. So let me let me proceed, Sa. Let me let yeah. me wrap this up. Let me proceed. Yeah. All right. So let me bring this back up. Yes, All screen. Right. All right, cool. All right. Yeah. So I read that at the national level, states, and then when it says states. It's talking about member states, meaning that the United States is a member state, South Africa is a member state, France is a member state, Ghana is a member state, should take concrete and practical steps through the adoption and effective implementation of national and international legal frameworks, policies, and programs to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance faced by people of African descent, taking into account the particular situation of women, girls, and young males in the following areas, recognition, 
justice development and multiple or aggravated discrimination at the regional and international levels the international community and international and regional organizations are called among other things to raise awareness disseminate the Durban Declaration and Program of Action and the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, assist states in the assist states in the full and effective implementation of their commitments under the Durban Declaration and Program of Action, collect statistical data, incorporate human rights into development programs, and honor and preserve historical memory of people of African descent. This is what this program is here to do. You, oh, you get an aid from the international community, which includes member states in the African continent. This allows that bridge so you can request them for aid. But see, we got Negroes saying, but the Africans don't mess with it. See, we got, we got Negroes saying stuff like that. That's why we can't get nowhere, because of divide and conquer, right? Now, I'm going to read this real quick. So under recognition, the recognition component of this program is the right to equality and non-discrimination. States should remove all obstacles that prevent their equal enjoyment of all human rights, economic, social, cultural, civil, and political, including the right to development, promote the effective implementation of national and international legal frameworks, withdraw reservations contrary to the object and purpose of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and consider withdrawing other reservations undertake a comprehensive review of domestic legislation with a view to identifying and abolishing provisions that entail direct or indirect discrimination, adopt or strengthen comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation and ensure its effective implementation, provide effective protection for people of African descent and review and repeal all laws that have a discriminatory effect on people of African descent facing multiple aggravated or intersecting forms of discrimination, adopt, strengthen, and implement action-oriented policies, programs, and projects to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance designed to ensure full and equal enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms by people of African descent, establish and or strengthen national mechanisms or institutions with a view to formulating, monitoring, and implementing policies to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance, and promoting racial equality with the participation of representatives of civil society. My organization is a part of this. And this is the stuff that we're doing, working hand in hand with this program and the international community to get this done. That's what we're doing behind the scenes. Also, it deals with education, right? Very similar. Celebrate the launch of the Central Decade, organize national conferences and other events like what we're doing, aimed at triggering an open debate and raising awareness on the fight against racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance with the participation of all relevant stakeholders, including government, civil society representatives, and individuals or groups of individuals who are victims. Promote greater knowledge and recognition of and respect for the culture, history, and heritage of people of African descent. Promote the positive role that political leaders and political parties, leaders of religious communities, and the media, which is you, sir, could further play in fighting racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance by inter alia, publicly recognizing and respecting the culture, history, and heritage of people of African descent. Sir, you're already doing this. You're not even aware of it. So why don't you make it official? I'm going to show you how to do that, sir. Raise awareness through information and education measures with a view to restoring the dignity of people of African descent and consider making available the support for such activities to NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Support education and training initiatives for NGOs. Ensure the textbooks and other educational materials. Listen to this, sir. This is relevant to what's happening now, especially in the South that reflect historical facts accurately as they relate to past tragedies and atrocities, in particular slavery, the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, and colonialism, so as to avoid stereotypes and the distortion or falsification of these historic facts, which may lead to racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance, including the role of respective countries therein. So now in America, and several Southern states, they're pushing initiatives to remove slavery out of the school books. You know about this, right, Sal? This is an initiative that they're pushing at the state level. Are you aware of this? Do you know that this is going on? Can you hear me? All right, I'm going to keep going. 
I hear you. Keep going. You know, I'll be okay. getting phone calls throughout this. No, 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 whole- I understand. So yeah. what I was saying, what I was saying was today in the South, they push in legislation to remove out of the textbooks the slave trade, transatlantic slave trade, and colonialism so they can avoid stereotypes, right? So the reason why they're doing that is because they see that as stereotypical. They see that as discrimination against white people. Why do you got to be harping on slavery so much and, and the atrocities that your answers are with? We're in 2024. We need to move away from that. Kids don't need to be burdened by that. This is what they say. And the reason why they can get away with that is because our political leaders and even us ourselves who are not putting um, various ballots and our local government to pass to make sure they do not remove those books because that's going to continue to be a stain and a stigma on America until all of us are gone. They're going to have to face the demons that they created. They cannot run away from this. They got to pay. And this is the best way to get it done if we are aware about it. A lot of us are not. So I'm going to keep going. All right. Yes, sir. Let me go to justice real quick. Now, this is something that's very important because a lot of us can already relate to that. I know I've been stopped and frisked several times while I lived in New York. I know I've been stereotyped out here and pulled over living out here in Atlanta just for being black. Right. And we know in America, there are tons of our brothers and sisters being shot and killed by the police all the time. And there's getting no justice. What justice have we got when the Asians in America were being assaulted, they went up to the White House, they smacked Biden in in the back of his head and said, all right, nigga, let me tell you something. You're going to go ahead and push forth this legislation to make sure we protect it. When they shoot and kill black people, you know what happens? They allow us to protest and they allow us to riot. And guess what? We go back home. Nothing changes. They said, oh, we're going to defund the police. How's that going? (laughs) So in the justice element, It's about introducing measures to ensure equality before the law, notably in the enjoyment of the right to equal treatment before the tribunals and all other organs administrating justice, designing, implementing, and enforcing effective measures to eliminate the phenomenon properly known as racial profiling, eliminating institutionalized stereotypes concerning people of African descent, and applying appropriate sanctions against law enforcement officials who act on the basis of racial profiling. We're not utilizing the international community to fix these problems. That's why they still exist. We don't have somebody big and bad, just like the U.S., that we can go to in the event that they're still doing stuff like this. We can put measures in place, and if they disrespect it, we can bring it before the international community. Ensuring that people of African descent have access to effective protection and remedies through the competent national tribunals and other state institutions against any acts of racial discrimination and the right to seek from such tribunals just and adequate reparation or satisfaction for any damage suffered as a result of such discrimination. We're not accessing this. Adopting effective and appropriate measures, including legal measures, as appropriate to combat all acts of racism. Facilitating access to justice for people of African descent who are victims of racism by providing requisite legal information about their rights and providing legal assistance when appropriate. Preventing and punishing all human rights violations affecting people of African descent, including violence, acts of torture. You know, they're still getting lynched in the South. Acts of torture, inhumane, or degrading treatment, including those committed by state officials. Ensuring that people of African descent, like all the persons, enjoy all the guarantees of a fair trial and equality before the law as enshrined in relevant international human rights instruments, and specifically the right to the presumption of innocence, which we don't have, the right to assistance of counsel and to an interpreter, the right to an independent and impartial tribunal guarantees of justice and all the rights to which prisoners are entitled. This is not happening. This is what we need. Inviting the international community and its members to honor the memory of the victims of these tragedies with a view to closing those dark chapters in history and as a means of reconciliation and healing. All of our brothers and sisters are getting shot and killed out here by the police. And guess what? The international community says we want to honor them internationally for what's going on here to make that plight worldwide so more entities can get involved and we can hold America under further scrutiny. 
sanctions can be imposed on America from the international community if they fail to implement this. But that is based on our request for these things to happen. And when you don't know about it, nothing can happen. Last point, let me get to development. Consistent with the Declaration on the Rights of Development, states should adopt measures aimed at guaranteeing active, free, and meaningful participation by all individuals, including people of African descent, in development and decision-making related thereto and in the fair distribution of benefits resulting therefrom. Recognizing that poverty is both a cause and a consequence of discrimination, states should, as appropriate, adopt and strengthen national programs for eradicating poverty and reducing social exclusion that take account of the specific needs and experiences of people of African descent and should also expand their efforts to foster bilateral, regional, and international cooperation in implementing those programs. States should implement actions to protect ancestral groups of people of African descent. Education, states should take all necessary measures to give effect to the right of the people of African descent particularly children and young people, to free primary education and access to all levels and forms of quality public education without discrimination. States should ensure that quality education is accessible and available in areas where communities of African descent live. I'm going to show you what I've done so this can work. Take measures to ensure that public and private education systems do not discriminate against or exclude children of African descent and that they are protected from direct or indirect discrimination negative stereotyping, stigmatization, and violence from peers or teachers. We see teachers assaulting young black girls and boys in classes. What's happening about it? We share it on social media. Nothing changes. There's no proaction. Employment. They should take concrete measures to eliminate racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance in the workplace against all workers, in particular people of African descent, including migrants, and ensure that full equality of all before the law, including labor law and limiting barriers where appropriate to participation in vocational training, collective bargaining, employment contracts, and trade union activity. I'm going to say this real quick. I worked an IT contract where I was the only Black person that was able to get that job with the specialized IT skills that I had, and there was no other Black candidates that were being brought in. So you know what I did? Once I got in, I looked at the employee handbook and I saw that, you know, affirmative action, right? Affirmative action states in the fine print, they should have had X amount of employees at any given time that are black. That's what it says. And when I looked, I said, oh, how come I'm the only, now there's, there's East Indians there, right? There's white people there, right? There's uh, foreigners from, from Ukraine that was there working there, right? every other race under the sun, except for African-Americans. So when I saw this, I went and spoke to HR, right? And I drafted up a paper with help from the people on the African descent forum, right? It's a working group of experts. And I served it to them and I say, hey, you're discriminating based on number one, state and federal law, international law, and your own employee handbook policy. I said, I know several candidates that I can bring in that are equally as qualified as me, to work these positions. They gave me pushback at first, but when I had my friends in the international community call, you know, from this program call and speak to their legal advisor and so forth, guess what? The next day they put out a vacancy saying that they're hiring African-Americans. I got two of my friends who are looking for work in there because of this program. They're feeding their family right now. This is how it works in practicality. Health. States should take measures to improve access to quality health services to people of African descent. Housing. Recognizing the poor and insecure housing conditions in which many people of African descent live, states should develop and implement policies and projects as appropriate aimed at into area, ensuring that they gain and sustain a safe and secure home and community in which to live in peace and dignity. I don't feel that way in the projects. I don't feel that way in some rural areas where black people live. I don't feel like that. I don't feel safe. I don't feel secure. And the conditions in which they're living in is deplorable. But we can do something about it. And we don't have to wait on the state or the federal government to do anything because they had years, hundreds of years to do something about it. And they have not done anything. Thank you, Brother Malcolm X. Thank you, Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanan, for making this possible for us, right? I'm going to say this. So when I saw all of this and I say, wow, okay, this is great. 
How can I stand on the shoulders of my ancestors that came before me? So I did immense study over 15 years ago, 12, 15 years ago on the Black Panther Party. Party, the Black Panther Party. They were a political party. A lot of people, secular Americans, not us that are conscious, think that the Black Panthers were just these people that bear, bear arms and was protecting their community against the police and shooting up the police. They don't know anything about the programs that the Black Panther Party created on behalf of Black people. In here, it goes over 66 programs that they created for us. A lot of you know about the free lunch program. They started it about the um, uh, seniors. So protection for seniors, what they were doing is walking seniors home every day. They had a whole program where brothers would protect seniors from any adverse violence, uh, assaults, um, racial profiling. They were protecting them. They had a whole program to do that. They also had a free clinic program providing health. Matter of fact, it's because of the Black Panther Party that more awareness came to people that have sickle cell. It was because of them. But guess what? Over time, the government took these programs and moved them off the map and they took ownership of it. You know, just like imperialists and colonialists do. Right. They see something good. They kill off the people doing it and then they take it for themselves and then they sell it back to the people. Like, hey, look what we're doing for you. <laughs> you see that? So I looked at this and I said, you know what? Now that in 2024 we have this program, maybe I should look at what our ancestors did and replicate it you understand what i'm saying that's an alignment with these goals for this program and then now we have a greater way to liberate our people now all of those who die fighting on the front lines can no longer turn on their grave no more all they're going to do is look down on us with a smile that's what i want to do for our ancestors is that what you want to do for your ancestors so what are the things that i'm doing i'm working with the permanent forum on people of african descent on august 2nd 2021, the General Assembly formally operationalized the permanent forum of people of African descent as a consultative mechanism for people of African descent and other relevant stakeholders as a platform for improving the safety and quality of life and livelihoods of people of African descent. The permanent forum will also serve as an advisory body to the Human Rights Council in line with the program of activities for the implementation of the International Decade for People of African Descent and in close coordination with the existing mechanisms. The resolution also describes the modalities, format, and substantive and procedural aspects of the permanent forum. That's the first thing. This is who I work with to say, hey, this is our plight here in America. These are the things that we're facing. How can I implement all of this paperwork stuff that you'll put it on paper and make it real for my community? How can I do that? You have to correspond with them and they'll say, okay, look, this is what you do to get this. This is what you do to get that. And I mentioned to you one example in which they helped me get something done to help feed more black people. So this is the group who we, who are interested parties, work with directly. So that way, anything that we see on here and we want to learn how to create a vehicle to execute it, to get it from point A to point Z, this is the group that will assist with this. And guess what? Everybody on this group is black. Okay, I just want to make sure I put it out because, you know, some people are just, oh, they black. Is this black? Is that? They think everything black, 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 black. black. Okay, black, they black, black. We got that. Now what? Are you still going to complain about something? So another thing that I've done is that I work with domestic in, un, unincorporated counties and towns and cities to create incorporated municipalities or black cities. What are you talking about, Devon? This right here is Dr. Captain Rice. Okay. She's a political activist. All right. Why do you see me here with her? And why do you see that shirt I'm holding that says Green Haven? The city is coming. It's because her and a couple other individuals in Central and South DeKalb looked at the community and said, wow, white folk took over downtown. They gentrified it, pushed back. You know the bluff? I don't know if those of y'all from Atlanta or Vincent, you know about the bluff? Yeah, they wiped all that out. They gentrified the entire bluff. Right, that's right there by the Mercedes Benz Stadium. They gentrified that whole thing, kicked all the black people out, kicked grandma and them out, and moved them all out and redid that whole area. Guess what? Because our people are people of routine, black people still come over there in that area, but they have no place they can stay or hang out with at the bar, right? So she looked at that and she said, you know what? What they're doing next is they examining other historic black communities and they want to set up their own city there. 
and then they want to gentrify and move our people out. She said, nope, that's not happening. So she decided that she was going to get that section, a large section of DCAP, incorporated as a municipality. And in order to remove racism, xenophobia, uh, discrimination related intolerances, et cetera, what you do is the people running the city have to live in the city. Because what happens is when a city is not doing that, they will outsource from a white community, get somebody white that don't live in that community, bring them in. And guess what? Now they're, everybody looks different than them. Everybody's acting different than them. And guess what? They can shoot, kill, uh, rob, beat, whatever they want to do, right? And then go back to their further community and not even care about it, not even blink an eye. But if they live in the community that they're policing, in the community where they're passing laws, in the community where they're judging, they are going to be affected by the decisions that they make immediately from the community that they live in because they got to live there with the people who they're doing this towards. So the whole dynamic changes. If you know that uh, Freddie is a 16-year-old that has autism, that sometimes has public outbursts, but because he has a mental disorder, and you outsource a white police officer to come and police or walk the beat in that community, and they see him acting up and don't have that history, do you think they're going to care when they pull that gun out? Get on the ground. Get on the ground right now. He obviously cannot comprehend what's going on. It's going to frustrate him even, even more. And then now you have a situation where now Fred is dead at 16, shot dead in the street because he's not complying to the officer's commands. But if we have somebody named David who lives in the community, who's a police officer, who knows about Fred, he's not going to pull a gun on him. He knows Fred is like this. Hey, talk to his parents. Hey, do you guys need some other aid? Let me get him back home. Hey, let me de-escalate the situation. That's the difference when you have a black cityhood, because everybody that is on the legislative, judicial, and executive branch, they live in the community. So I was working with Dr. Captain Rice to get Greenhaven done. In Atlanta, we have Stonecrest and we have South Fulton, which are two black cityhoods that already exist out here in Atlanta. We was creating the third, which was Greenhaven, which would be a much bigger city than anything in the entire state of Georgia. And of course, guess what? We had a small group of white people that lived in the community that would send black people to spy on what we're doing in our meetings and find ways legislatively and by putting pressure on political parties that represent the people that live in the community to say, no, we're not having that. You know why? Because once we do this, we're going to reverse gentrification. We're going to make the area more black. And you think white people are going to stay there? No, they're not. We're going to beautify it in our own way. We're going to take control of the utilities, right? Take control of the police enforcement or public safety and do all these things. This is going to reverse gentrification. And this is what we need to do because a lot of the places that a lot of us live in are being gentrified right before our eyes. And guess what? Black people don't got no power to do anything. But if you know about the home rule versus the Dillon law and you know what you have access to based on what this international decade program lists out, and looking at the legal frameworks that already exist, either they need improvement or things that we don't even know that exist that we can utilize, which we use the home rule in order to do this, you have power and you have access to it. You just got to know about it. And this is what this program is going to do. And this is what our event is going to teach you what we're doing. So this is one. And I got a video on YouTube with me speaking with Dr. Dr. Rice, attending these sessions, putting the word out, and then helping other black communities outside the state of Georgia do the same thing. We help with two different uh, incorporated municipalities in small areas in South Carolina. And I think the other one was in Mississippi. And then now there are small black cities there because we worked with them and we showed them how they can do it. So I'm not just talking this, we are doing the field work, right? And then on top of that, right? I use other platforms to discuss these things as well. So, Sa, who's this? Who's that? Can you see? Is it me or I can't hear you? Are you talking, Sa? Yeah, yeah. What's up? What's up, brother? Look at the screen. I said, who's that? Oh, that's my that's my little brother, man. He's bigger than me, but that's still my little brother. 
Say his name. Come on, bro. Why <laughs> his name, brother? I, I had a seeing moment right now. Tariq <laughs> Nasid, man. Tariq okay, so, yeah, so Shout out to Tariq yes. Nasid. Hold on. Now that you got me, shout out to Tariq Nasheed for the great work that he is doing, man. Shout out to that brother. Go ahead. Yeah, so the reason why I bring him up is because he had an event in 2020, uh, a foundational Black American conference, and it was, was because of you, sir. Wasn't I there? Huh? Wasn't I there? No, you wasn't there for that. Oh, I wasn't there. Yeah, no, no, yes, you was. Yeah. You was there. You are the one that got me at that event, sir. So shout out to you, you for know, that. Sir. Because we interviewed the sister, sister in the backstage. Remember the sister that was health, the health sister. Yes. So Sonetta put a word in because he was looking for a speaker. Sonetta said, yo, Devon, blah, blah, blah. Sonetta connected me to Tariq Nasheed. And then now I use that platform to talk about what I just told y'all about. That's right. So any platform I was getting publicly. And again, they had over 900 people in attendance. This yeah. was during COVID, sir. That yeah. place was packed. Damn and then right. after that, I spoke to at least 100 people telling them about this program, get in touch with me and show them how they can execute it. So thank you, sir. This is what, sir, listen, I got to give you your props because you have helped sometimes. I ain't going to front. Sometimes yeah. I may stay away from the controversy, but I'll come in in the clutch when it comes to yeah. liberating our yeah, people. You feel you. what I'm no, saying? No. Yeah. So thank you for that, sir. So I no, use no. this platform to speak to almost 900 people during COVID in 2020 about the access that we have to fix societal ills in our community. All right, let me move forward. All right. And you can see, if you're interested, uh, you can just type the FBA conference, Devon Prospect on YouTube, and you can watch everything that I said at that conference, all right? Now, here's another thing, right? Remember it mentioned about education? So this is the Freedom Coalition of Charter Schools, right? So this is an organization that goes to black communities and tells parents, you don't have to send your kids to the public school if they're not getting quality education. Did you know that there are charter schools in your community that are similar to public schools? However, the teaching approach is much different, like the Montessori and others, in which it can better captivate your kids, instill STEM, and also give you better results in regards to the education from A to Z so that they can be more applicable to go on to further or higher uh, education, right? This is what programs like this does. They cry out to tell black people that you have options. You don't have to stay and keep your kids in a public school because they want you to stay in a public school to limit your educational options and put an agenda in your child's head that you got to fight when they come back home. So I work with them. If you look at this video that I have here, I was out there by Tyler uh, Perry's studio and we did a whole protest there about freedom of choice for black parents to know that there are options for your children and that you don't have to restrict them or be told that they only have one path to education. Damn, you put in work, brother Devon. You yeah. Put in work. So you'll see me in that video. You'll see me in the street, marching, protesting, yeah, educating people. Yeah, I see you. Yeah, yeah, we don't play games. We put in work. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So also um, in 2017, like I mentioned earlier, there was an event out here in Atlanta that Sonetta, Ankh, and a couple other people uh, helped put together. I think DJ helped put that together as well. And it was a showcase for us to talk about issues in the community, what solutions are. And I did a video called Globalizing Black Power, and I showed Black people in America how to connect with higher powers internationally so we can get the relief and aid we need to solve issues here domestically and also assist with our repatriation and provide us with the tools necessary to create our own reparations. See, reparations, if it's only limited to economics, is problematic. There was no institution erected that after Black people went through PTSD, after slavery, put them into an institution run and owned by Black people to say, look, let us heal you. Your mind, your, 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 your outlook, your perspective, your wounds, we're here to heal you make you whole again, and then tell you, you can create your own. You ain't got to integrate. You, you are great enough to create your own. We never had an institution to repair Black people mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. We never had an institution dedicated for that after slavery. And this is why when you give Black folk or niggas money today, guess what they're going to do with that money, Sam? Go support white supremacy. 
go go get material things that the white man tells them is valuable. Go spend their money on stuff that's frivolous and in vain and do nothing to build up their own people. This is why we cannot receive financial liberation when there's no mental liberation. If you don't mentally liberate your people, then what they do with their money is not going to support black people. The dollar only stays in a black community four to six hours and then it's out of here. You know why? It's black people don't value themselves. Black people were told not to value themselves. Black people have an inherited hate now due to epigenetics of what the slave master did to the black man and woman when it was on the plantation. They ingrained this into them. And shout out to Dr. Joy DeGru. She did a whole series on his lectures, books, and everything, educating white folk on how black folk are because of their ancestors. If mental liberation is not had, financial liberation is going to be a disaster. So in this video, I teach you step by step how do you can become an NGO, how you can be a grassroots organization, how you can even be an individual and get access to this stuff, to do this work. Because we all have access to it and we all can get the tools. So I've also, with my organization, we created programs as well to help with this in alignment with all of these points that you see in the International Decade for People of African Descent. Remember, 2015, when I started the program, I learned about it during, after the wake of Dr. Dr. Ben. I learned about it. And since then, I've been saying something about it. And everything that I do, I've been incorporating all of these elements and so things that we're doing at a local and state level for our people. So I created a program called Jubilee Manumission. We offer free debt elimination services to the community. It's a program that's designed to teach our people how to be financially stable, how to stay away from debt, how to eliminate their own debt, and how to be economically savvy and invest outside of what they currently have so their money keeps going further and they don't have to worry about debt anymore. I have a program called Naturopath to Eden. And the purpose of this is to provide free naturopathic health services to our community. You got an ailment, a sickness, a disease, or whatever the case may be, we're here to assist you and provide you regimen plans to resolve that societal ill. And we offer our consultation for free to the Black community to teach them how to do it. Why? Because everything that we're doing financially and health-wise, these are two areas, poverty and sickness, that we have the highest statistics in. So our job is to minimize or mitigate that so that way it comes at a more manageable level so that way when we take advantage of all of these tools available to us, we can reverse those effects happen into our community. I created a program, it's a program called the Ezra Institute, which is a virtual homeschooling system for our people. Why? Because Black families should have options in regards to schooling. As you can see here, I was, I was part of this march and this protest and this organization, right? And that we should be able to extend that to those who are virtual and remote in the African diaspora. Create an institute where we have Black teachers, a Black curriculum, a Black program, everything that's designed for our predisposition. Shifra and Poor's Birthing School, which is a midwifery program where we provide midwifery services and we teach parents, you don't have to put your kids in a hospital to give birth. All right, Brother Devon. Um Yes, sir. Are you willing to take a couple of questions? Yeah, yeah, I'm almost done. I got. I just want to talk about the last program, and I'm done. And as you see, I go back to this picture with Dr. Leonard Jeffries. And then the other one is Handmaids of Zion. And again, these are stemming from my personal disposition, but I created these programs that anybody can engage in, right? And the purpose of this one is that one reason why a lot of Black people just can't do anything, because they don't get a break. They don't get a breather. So we create a program that can send aid to these families in need, you know, single parent families and even dual parent families that have a lot of kids and responsibilities and they just need help. They just need to be with Sometimes they need a vacation and they can't get one. Sometimes they just need to go out. They want to go out to the movies with their husband or wife and they can't do so. Sometimes they maybe want to go and do some activism or black liberation or whatever, and they can't do so. So we create a program where we provide the resources to go and assist these black families to relieve and alleviate them of these day-to-day -day burdens. So that way they have the free time to get involved in stuff like this so that they can make a difference in their community. So this is just some of the programs out of tons of programs that we offer. And again, I took a look at the blueprint that our ancestors had took from those blueprints and created something more modern to help our family. So this right here, again, I'm going to end off here. Please come to this event. 
on Sunday, March 24th, because we will go in further detail about all the things that I covered. I want to thank Sonetta for this opportunity for me to show the community that outside of my Israelite disposition, there's tons of other Black liberation stuff that I'm doing. I just never get this type of platform to present it. And today is that day. And I want to say hats off to you, Sonetta, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, brother. Um, Let me ask you a question. Are you ever going to run for office, brother? Yes. Oh. When? 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 <laughs> yeah. When? I would say, yeah, that so I say you really put your best work forward and really Correct. make changes. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, what I'm gonna say is like I have a, yeah, so so I'm 40 now, and when I get 50, I have 10 years of doing more groundwork before I dedicate the retirement years to running for office. But I'm only gonna run for office, Sonetta, in a black city hood. Because we got to show our people. Because, you know, black people are show and tell. And they got to see it first. So when we create and formulate our own black city, shout out to Brother Reggie. Because, you know, Brother Reggie been telling you about the black city plan. Yeah. Probably a lot of y'all slept on that. But once we incorporate, like we have out here in Atlanta, a black cityhood with black people running the city at the judicial, legislative, and executive level, and I get elected to office in that city, and we implement all of these things that I just mentioned to you to fix and resolve and mitigate all the societal ills that we face and show that as an example for other black towns and counties and so forth to replicate the same. Then I know that after 10 years of putting that groundwork to get to that office, now we'll have something that's replicable by our people and also can fund repatriation to replicate black communities in the African diaspora and on the continent itself. All right. Beautiful. And so, let me ask you, brother. Peace to you, brother. N O N. I mean, um, B N O. Yeah, it's B N O. It's B N O, man. All right, B N O. You used to be an Israelite. Nah, I never was an Israelite, man. Okay, never was. Brother, do you got a question pertaining to the topic, brother? Yes, I have a question pertaining to the topic. First of all, I just want to big up Divine Prospect for what he's doing and all the work he's putting in. I've never seen anybody lay down something that is actually um, playbook ready, you know, like you put in that work in these cities that are in Atlanta, you said these city hoods, like what did it take to get those to where they are today? And who put you on to that kind of program to get that shit started? Yeah, no, profanity, uh, no profanity. Yeah, my bad, my bad, my bad. It's okay. Yeah. Shout out to you, my brother Bino. Thank you so much for acknowledging some good that is happening in the community because there's tons of others who are doing great work in the community as well. And um, so Stonecrest and South Fulton took blood, sweat, and tears to put together for Black people to organize together, look at their communities that's 80 plus percent their own and say, okay, um, what is one of the major issues besides poverty, health, and all that we already know is gentrification. So they decided, do the state have something, some legal framework that we can access in order for us to create one ourselves? Back in 1996, Sandy Springs, which is a, 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 black, a city hood, it's not black, a black, a city hood out here in, in, in Atlanta, decided, white people decided, hey, you know what? We got a lot of local problems that the county is not even worrying about. We're going to create our own city and deal with it ourselves. White folk did this in 1996. And then they kept doing it from place to place. So all the incorporated uh, places in the county, they started going to place to place to place. One of them did it. It worked. They was a pioneer. They showed people that this prototype works. And then it started to become replicated. So when black people saw this and realized, oh, shoot, our town's about to be gentrified, they said, let's go ahead and put this in place and see if it actually works for us. And they did it. And even though there are some issues, because there's no perfect city or town, they have yeah. alleviated a lot of the six major things that are facing black people from education to health to political access and a voice to um, to education. I think I said education before um, to to uh, beautification, land development, et cetera. They've been able to provide this for people. And it's us that's running these places. It's no foreign people who have just moved over here a year or two, wanted to get involved in the political scene and then paved the way for other people outside of our ethnicity to come in and take over. They've sealed it so the legislative, judicial, and the executive grants is all our people that live in that community. How did I find out about that? 
I started going to various uh, town hall meetings in black communities to find out what are we doing? Are we doing anything? Are we discussing anything? Are we saying anything? And that's when I went to one of them and I found Dr. Rice and I said, oh, shoot, she's talking about creating a whole black cityhood for our people that we're going to run. And it, I'm like, yo, I'm with this. So when I when I when I went there and I met her and she put me on to a political activist and so forth and I learned how this thing was working, I said, yo, we got to get the word out. And then I sat on their on their uh, committee and I assisted, et cetera. And I was just happy to be there. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Green Haven was so big that so many white people came against it that that project is not here no more. There's no more Green Haven. However, there are other kinds of black cities such as Vista, Green and others that are now picking up the work that uh, Green Haven had left behind and creating more black cityhoods, not just here in Georgia, but several other states that have the home rule that allows them to do so. But what can we do when white people come against us to stop it? Is there anything that we can do to m stop them from crushing big plans that we have? You know, like and so there I must be something to stop that. Devon. Because I, I want that to happen like everywhere. It sounds like that's something that people could do. But if there's the powers that be that are trying to crush our goals, we must have a defense mechanism against that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So there is something we could do, right? We could get the word out. We have a virtual community now. We're not just limited to the times before social media to just our community. We have to get other people involved. So, for example, one thing I've done out here is reach out to several celebrities to assist. They have money. They have power. If they can use that to leverage with the initiatives that we have out here and abroad to create these incorporated municipalities, then we can get all the aid we need. But if all of our aid is from black people to say, hey, black people, we need X amount of money to raise this money, do this, this and that. And we know most of the black people that we're asking are impoverished. Then, of course, if several white people come in and they're united, it could be just 10 of them or 20 of them. And they're united and they put their white dollars, which they can get off of their equity and their homes and all of that together. Guess what? They could put pressure on the black politicians to say, hey, look, y'all better not support that. You know, we're the ones funding your campaign. This is how they're working. But we have enough black celebrities in Atlanta to get this stuff done. They say, look, this is what we're trying to do. It can benefit you as well. And you can write this stuff off. And we can leverage that from people who have the influence, have the affluence and have the resources that we continue to push forth these communities. Unless we go to a middle class community that have enough money amongst themselves in order to put this in place. Now, I'm going to say this. We say that, oh, white people's against us. No, there are black cityhoods out here that was formed where white people are at. The problem is they have an issue with when it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. See, typically they'll leave you alone when it's small. When you have something like creating a black cityhood that's going to be one of the top 10 cities in all across America that you're going to form out here in Atlanta, where they're trying to gentrify Atlanta, then it becomes problematic. So the white people who live there initially, who are there, you know, to kind of test the waters, you know, they speak to their friends, they find out, hey, where's the next prospect city or town that they're going to build a new mall in, or they're going to build this in and create this at. And then they go and they sell it there. They live there. They get the property when it's cheap. And then their property value goes up once they start gentrifying the area. We spotted this. We said, look, we got to take this over and we got to go on from there. All so right. I think, All right. Your question. I think we got to go All to the right. next question. Yeah. Um, when you say, when you think white people is against us, it's not just white people, man. It's a lot of people, including your own people, bro. Yes, sir. I've, I've witnessed it. I've seen it. Even when you're fighting for reparations, there's black people against reparations. <laughs> so you and fight it's not. The reason why I say that is because right. a lot of people here keep thinking it's the white man. The white man's a whole boogeyman to everybody. Right. Oh, the exactly. white man's a boogeyman. He's going to get me. And exactly. they think and when you have that mentality, guess what, sir? You're not going to do nothing. You're just going to sit there and keep blaming the white man. Exactly. I'm not saying not blaming the white man for anything. Like you right beside you. That's too. what I'm about to say. Because the white man scare a lot of y'all. So I use that boogeyman speech to get y'all into action, right? But like Sa says, it's not just it's not just the white man. All ethnicities have their own establishments and their own cities and towns, and they run everything. Right. They're not worried about no white man, but y'all are. A lot of y'all are. And guess what? The reason why our program didn't work because those black people. Those white people were using black faces to come against us. Black people That's coming right. in, thinking that they were sympathizers, wanted to help us. 
they were all being paid by these white organizations to come in and dismantle what we got going on. So you got right. to watch right. as well. Dr. Daniel, let's go. Hey, try to keep your um answers short, Devon. I got it, sir. I got you. Get Dr. Daniel, unmute yourself and let's get it in. Okay, I'm coming out to the panel. Nice yeah. presentation, Divine. I appreciate the work that you're putting in this area. I do have two questions for you. Uh, one, in Africa, one of the big issues in Africa is the devaluation of the dollar, okay? The devaluation in some countries is like 150 to 1. And that really weakens like your purchase power and things of that nature. Do you have any opinion in some of the, the devaluation of the dollar? In my opinion, I think that we have to break away from the IMF system and uh, detach from the U.S. dollar and focus on, uh, I think Gaddafi talked about attaching it to gold and some of the natural resources in Africa and land in Africa. I was just wondering in some of your research if you had any thoughts about that. Yes, and that's an excellent point right there. Um, and well, thank you, sir. That's an excellent point right there. So one of the solutions that we propose is called community currency. Community currency has been used in other nations where there was an impoverished group of people that lived in a particular society and could not find the means to get up out of poverty because everything they were doing was lying upon the national currency or the state currency. So they created their own currency. By creating their own currency and placing the value on it by matching it against actual assets and all the labor and work of other individuals, they was able to increase that medium of exchange amongst their community. It could be a credit line system amongst the community. It could be a coin if you want to say a coin. They created these things in order for them to actually take ownership of all of the items or what we call GDP for that community and keep it within their community and valued against their currency and not the national currency. Now, because they did that, they was able to liberate themselves from out of that impoverished state and actually be a community that can actually compete against the national currency. All you got to do is type in where, community where currency. Was where was that done? Hold on. Let me, I bring one up for you right now. It's been, a, it's been a while since I went over that, but let me bring up one right now. I, I, I mean, if that works, that's going to be very, very important. Yeah, I've, I've spoken about this in a lecture that I can I can share with you. Um, I can is put my uh, my email address on is that my done anywhere right now. Is that being done anywhere right now? Yes. Yes, it is. Where? where? Yes. Most of it is in third world countries where that's working, where it's actually working that. And if you take a look at it, the way some communities, especially out in Alabama and certain black communities in the rural areas are exactly as far as dollar for dollar, the same as a country in, let's say, a third world country like East India, right? And in their empowered <laughs> communities living below the poverty level, right? They're not third world. It's a developing country. Third world's outdated. Oh, okay. Let's say developing countries, yeah. right? I say third world because that's more colloquial, right? Um, but that's the reason why I say that. So they've attempted that. It's been successful. There's case studies of that as well. I think the last time I told you about it was back in 2016. So to see where it's at now, I definitely have to go back and look into it. But I did a lecture talking about community currency where I do mention these areas in which it was done and the case study. So if you're interested in that, I would love to send that information to you. And um, I think you just need my email. I need your email somehow. You could probably put it in a chat. I'll grab that, it and I'll send it to you. Okay, uh, we could do that. One one final question. Thank you very much. Okay. Is um, Let's say you do build a successful city, right? Um, we've seen that in the past, like Black Wall Street. And we see what folks have done by coming in and burning it down and bombing it out. Even more recently in modern day, you look at Flint, Michigan, which, which is a predominantly area of people of color, and how the government has just diverted toxic water and really destroyed the whole community by putting toxic lead water. I mean, you know, people can really destroy all cities that we built up in that respect. What's your thoughts and solutions to address that? Yeah. And the problem with that is that, again, the reliance is still on the local, state and federal level for any kind of aid or any kind of assistance with these type of political issues. Right. This program affords us to connect with the international community to get aid from issues like this happening in other parts of the world and resolutions that have been implemented to resolve those problems. So, again, if we keep everything that we have at the state and federal level, 
then what you see is what you're going to get. You're not going to get anything above what they're willing to offer us or provide to us. When you step outside of them and go to the international community with other member states that are invested in our success, then that's who you go to for assistance and ways to implement things and or get their aid and support to fix these local ills that we have. We've been too disconnected from the international community to even realize where we should begin to do anything. The first thing is know who to reach out to, how to reach out to them, and what is in place internationally that can be implemented at the local level to fix that type of issue. I, I, I fully agree with your international view, the international view that Malcolm uh, was talking about. I'm familiar from, with his readings and his teachings. As a matter of fact, that inspired me just recently this past year, we started an international uh, specifically Pan-African Glaucoma Association. I happen to be a glaucoma specialist. And so we have over 100 members who are glaucoma specialists from throughout the African diaspora. And we'll be having our first inaugural meeting uh, June 27th to the 29th in Accra, Ghana. Mm. And continue to have meetings in every couple of years in different areas throughout Africa to help address glaucoma, blindness, build an uh, internet network, and, uh, and, and, you know, try to solve our problems amongst ourselves as well in that respect. So I, I, I agree with you. That's awesome. I agree with what you about. I encourage you in your research. And I encourage all others uh, that are listening uh, to, in your area of expertise, in your area of passion, uh, to, you know, build international connections. And I think we're going to be in a position to really help our colleagues internationally, because we have the strongest dollar. We have access to the U.S. dollar, which is currently the strongest dollar. And I do agree with uh, some of the things that um, Mugabe did in Zimbabwe when he was taking the land back, because the Berlin Conference, which uh, created the colonization of Africa, one of the things, if you ever read that document, you'll see that they wanted access to land, ownership, being able to purchase land. And then, so, you know, the Africans were at a tremendous disadvantage because they didn't have the US dollar. So the US dollar was able to control everything. And that's why even to today, South Africa and South Africans own, uh, the colonial South Africans own probably about 90% of the land wealth in that respect. And that's still a problem until today. And most of the people who are politically free, they still live in townships when you go over there. So this is a big issue in terms of land distribution and financial redistribution and uh, you know, creating a new financial system that's more equitable than needs to be done. But on that note, I'll, other people have questions, so I'll let you go. Uh, keep up the good work. I enjoyed your presentation. And peace Thank out. Thank you, Doc. I appreciate it. I also put a link in the chat for you if you're interested in those case studies, okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Brother Reggie. Brother Reggie, what's up, man? Yeah, I'm here. How are you doing, uh, Brother Sarnetta? And uh, good presentation, Brother Divine. I was, uh, uh, since you, uh, well, I commend you for uh, really being boots on the ground on this, right? And and thinking things out. Uh, you should give me a call. But what I will say on this is that the, um, uh, in addition to my Black City Plan, the part that I did not write is the, uh, conversation on the town hall meetings, right? A town hall meeting is is where you take power away from the uh, from the, the from the local governments because um, what what happens is when a police uh, when a when a police shoots a child or the city malfunctions, we always go to the their area to to address them. They don't they don't come to the community. They, they, it's always some room in some police station. They're showing guns and drugs and opening up their case. That's not the that's not the place to hear it. The place to hear it is in the town hall. The uh, I, I I fashioned the Black City Plan by studying the American uh, Revolution and white cities and how they came to power, right? And uh, well, the American Revolution was won in the town hall. That is where uh, that is where the populace uh, show their power. You can elect an elected official, and we do this all the time, and, and we have a lot of black cities. We have more black cities than, uh, than Malcolm X and them could imagine. They can even imagine a black city. There was not one when he was here, right? Oh, but now we have mismanagement of black cities by the same people that we put in. 
So the only way to curb that is create is the town hall process. The town hall process is that um, people are elected to a town hall. Those and then they build the constituents. They force the mayor and the city council to come to the town hall to discuss, right? Rather than we trying to get time on their program. No time on our program, they do not get elected. We issue in referendums. You don't do the job in, in two years, we could we could whip, we can uh, we could pull you back. So um, you could just give me a call and we could talk about some of these things. My my uh we could talk about it on the phone. I have no uh negative uh comments that I uh, that I want to share, but I do want to talk to you about some things that you may and you may not know, but I am um, so proud of you, boots on the ground. And, uh, my Black City Plan, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it looks for different variations. And so there's no one size fits. So with that said, um, you are uh, you may be elected to, uh, to run uh, the town hall faster than you would be to run uh, the city. But if you run the town hall, that would be your launch part, your launch pad to uh, uh, being that uh, the head of a city official. So with that said, I know there's some few other questions and it's been a long show, but give me a call. Thank you. Bridget, Bridget, you also invited if you want to come. So when I, yeah, I'll, I'll I, I, when I, I know that you. I have to because you'll be pushing your program, right? Um, no, I'm not pushing so, my program. I'm just making awareness of the international gay take for people of African descent, and then we're only yeah, going to discuss how. That's, that's, uh, if if um, if we need to talk, right? If um, how can I say? Uh, just give me a, just give me a call, all right? Okay, I mean, I got you. You you are my my brother, my neighbor. Oh yeah, my, you're my elder. My, you in my my local city when you when you come, you know. You know, you know, I know you, right? Yes, so sir. Your family is here, so you, uh, you, you in my back neck of the woods. Just give me a call. All right? I got you, Reggie. Thank you, Doctor right, Reggie. Please. Like I said, please. out of all the people I know in the community that actually came with me, boots on the ground, brother Reggie was the only one that showed up with me. When was that, Reggie? Back in 2018, I'm when I did another call for action, he was the only person that showed up. That's crazy. I've always been your brother, brother divine. So. <laughs> so give me a call. And I, I have a few points that will I think will uh, help you. But if you can, if you know, if you think about it, and you understand the town hall process, that is how that is how you leverage uh, the city officials. They don't do what you want. If your town hall is organized, they won't be reelected, so they will have to cater exactly. over the corporations. Okay. Exactly. That's how. That's yeah. how I found out about. Um, Dr. Catherine Rice, and that's what they were teaching. Right. Exactly what you said is what they were teaching there. That's right. where the power was at. Yep. And uh, so, so, so it is the town hall. The town hall is where revolutions are made, but we don't have to do it illegally, right? We we don't have to be. We don't have to fight the power. We have to understand our power, and and it's 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 as American as so-called apple pie, but we've not put it in practice, and so. What we do is we elect people like like Mayor Adams, like the Negro Mayor Adams, right? Who puts his personal people into play, right? But at the end of the day, uh, these immigrants that are coming in from all over the world, right? The sanctuary city, they're catering to the, to them. But the people who struggled in our cities, they get it last. And this exactly. immigrant process is happening all over the country particularly in black communities. That's where the immigrants are being sent. Thank you. To black communities. And and so we have to make Eric Adams and people like him pay. No problem. Bye. All right. All right. Thank you, Thank Reggie. you my brother Reggie. Stand strong, man. What's up, bro? Talk to me. What's going on, man? Ron. Divine was good, man. Great presentation. What's going on? All right. I'll see you soon. See you shortly. But I just want to say, you know, I was just looking at the chat while you was doing your presentation. And, you know, it's unfortunate that everybody is 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 an expert or critic when it comes down to critiquing what, you know, the work that others are putting in. And I think now is, is the time for people just to 
you know, if, if you don't like what, what the brother's doing or if another brother's doing, it's time for you to get up and just get, get going and get moving. Put your, boot, your own boots on the ground, get your own movement, do what you need to do. Because at the end of the day, that'll make us more powerful as a people. If you've got critiques, you don't like what this brother's doing, you try to do things your way, you gain some traction, he gains traction, we meet up, now we 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 more powerful. But I think the days now, it's just getting redundant where we're sitting back and we everybody's saying, oh, it, they, they have all these these theories that they that they can't apply into practice, right? I think now it's time just for us to just start making these mistakes and stumbling and just just putting in the work. We're gonna we're gonna win some, we're gonna lose some, but we just gotta start moving forward. So enough of the the talking and let's just start putting this work in in action. So if you're not gonna be about that action, just move to the side because you're standing in the way. We trying to drop fifty over here. We trying to drop a hundred. Y'all just trying to do a Kobe on it. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what it is. <laughs> but excellent presentation. You know. Um, I'm gonna do everything in my power to be in attendance, if not on time, because of our uh, previous obligations. I'm definitely going. I'm, I'm gonna be around. You know what I'm saying? So we definitely going. We going. We going do what we do. <laughs> you know what we do. Yes, right? sir. You already Asad, know what it is. Asad, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for giving our uh, divine this platform to share the excellent work that he's doing behind the scenes. Um, everything is not always about a, a theoretical uh dispute or, or discourse. You know, there's a lot of real work that's being put in behind the scenes that we're doing, and these things we don't glorify but in this instance you know this was you know put to the forefront and promoted because this is something that is going to directly impact and, and affect our people in, in a positive way and this is something that the people really needed to see and not just see but be a part of you have the opportunity to be a part of this you have the opportunity to actually assert the change that you want so i just wanted to to say that shalom um Sa, shalom divine great, great, great presentation yes sir appreciate it my brother literally <laughs> so sorry i'm gonna say this and close out um yes, I like close he, us out, Devon. Close us yeah, out. Close it out. so i like what he said and again the purpose of putting things in the public is for critique you're gonna get critiqued and if you're afraid of that then you shouldn't be in the public space right but like he said if somebody disagrees or says that's not gonna work then you show me a better plan if you have a better plan i'll put mine aside and i'll work with you if you ain't got a better plan until you get a better plan, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. And at the end of the day, this is the only way, like he says, that we're going to get anything done. Don't wait around being an armchair scholar and say, this was wrong. That's wrong. I don't know why you're doing this. Why are you doing that? But you're sitting in your home, the comfort and safety of your home. I've been on the front lines protesting with our people. It's a video up that you put up. Uh, when was that? Style? Like two years ago when I was out there on the street, when curfew was enacted at 9 p.m., our people were still out there after they had protested and did everything, and it was going against the police, and the police had their guns drawn, ready to shoot and kill them, and I was there on the street telling them, go home. Why are you going to die in the street like this? What is this going to prove right now? We did what we did earlier. Now it's time to leave. I took the initiative. I got our people out the street safely so they can fight another day. You're in the comfort of your home talking about what other people should do. Why don't you come to one of these town hall meetings like Brother Reggie said? Why don't you come to events like this and see what it is that we're saying, see what it is that we're doing, or even offer your own suggestion on how this can get better. So media components like Sarnetta allows this to come to you for free. You ain't got to pay a dime to do this. But what you can pay is attention that when you have somebody in your community that's willing to say, I'm going to stand up and do something, either you strengthen that or you show them how to do it better. This is also called for the elders out there. Maybe in your generations, everything that you saw that happened failed. Maybe you want to give up on your people. And I'm telling you, we got the torch. There's no need to do that. I got you on my back. We're going to help you to the finish line because all our ancestors that paved the way for us, I want them all to smile down on us when this is all said and done. So click the link in the description below. Get your ticket to come to the event. Again, we have spots over for vendors too. So if you're vending as well, you can come out and vend, right? Very reasonable price of $25 just to get a vending table to vend with us, all right? So make it out. Let's get together and get these solutions popping. And I thank you, Sonata, for allowing me this opportunity to speak this. And again, Sonata helped me in a lot of different ways to get to this point. So even though behind the scenes, me and him may argue, may have little debates and stuff like that, he is truly my brother and he is about black liberation. Peace and shalom, family. Peace, my brother. Thank you. And you know, we always working together, man. Peace and black power to you, brother.